friends, let us join together in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, draw near to us, mindful of our own past, the stumbles and the struggles, the achievements and the hopes, and looking forward to your future, by your Spirit speak to us once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So paired with the story of Ananias that we heard read from Acts chapter 9 is then the lectionary Hebrew scripture reading for today that comes from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. And it's the story of God's call coming to the young boy who would become the priest and the prophet Samuel. Listen to the first 10 verses of 1 Samuel 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of the Lord had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And then God called Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go, lie down again. So Samuel went and lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. But the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And so he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. And therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this may sound like a science question, but it's actually a faith question. Is the world evolving and changing? Now, our immediate response is to say, yes, I believe so. Over time, continents have moved and shifted. In our ancient history, there were eons of ice ages and there were long seasons of heat. In the past, animals thrived, but then some went extinct. And sadly, now in more modern times, more animals are dying off because of humans' destructive habits. But actually, let me ask the question a second time. Is the stuff of the world evolving and changing? There's an evolutionary biologist, a man named Simon Morris. He's a person of faith, though, and so he reminds us that the building blocks of life, the stuff of this world, are not just physical ones. There is evolving physical nature, but there's also an evolving human nature. So what if the ability to reason, what if the capacity to imagine future possibilities, to care deeply for others around us, what if those abilities also evolve and change over time? We can visit the displays in the Carnegie Natural History Museum and as we walk through those hallways, we can see reconstructions of ancient dinosaurs and hominids that evolved into modern dogs and horses, and yes, even human beings. So imagine walking through the displays in the Carnegie Museum of Human History, if such a museum existed, 
And there you might see displays tracing human moral evolution. You would see the catalogs of developing weapons moving from spears to nuclear missiles. You would also though see the discoveries in medicine, new vaccines and antibiotics. You might see old exhibits depicting slaves in ancient Egypt and Rome, slaves picking sugar in the West Indies or cotton in the American South. But then hopefully that display would move forward into the abolition of slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. See, as people of faith, we affirm that the Creator God has shaped the whole development of Homo sapiens. And so in the same way, shouldn't we affirm that this same God is at work developing us as moral beings, as people evolving from more primitive moral views to more humane and righteous behaviors? And if that is true, well, then it begs the question, how does God guide this process? How does God awaken us from the slumbers of our imperfection and then call us to higher ways of life and community? Let's admit that none of us is at our best when we're awakened from a sound sleep. There's always that initial moment of befuddlement as we rub our eyes and toss back the covers trying to wake up. At our house, we have a very old, skinny Labrador who's 15 years old. Elfie can't see very well anymore, and she's developed the habit of barking at the back door when she wants to be let out. Now, actually, that's well and good if we're in the next room watching TV, but it's less endearing when we're sound asleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. But I suppose it serves a good and necessary purpose. Now, in the Bible story we just heard, the young boy Samuel was sound asleep in the temple of Shiloh, and he heard his name called twice in the middle of the night. Startled, a bit confused, he ran to his master, Eli, the high priest of the temple. And he said to him, Here I am. But Eli, also awakened from a sound sleep, sent the boy back to his mat. And this whole cycle repeated itself three more times. Only on the fourth go-round did Eli break the pattern. And this time he instructed Samuel to stay put and to listen to whatever God was going to say to him. Samuel heard God's words, words that actually bode ill for his master Eli and the entire priesthood in ancient Israel. But Samuel listened and took the words to heart. And he soon became the new spiritual leader of the Jewish nation. Now that is actually the second story of a call experience that we heard today. Earlier, Juliet read the story of Ananias from Acts chapter 9. Ananias was also awakened from a sleep, disturbed by this new vision from God that told him he was supposed to go and visit a man named Saul. Now Ananias was hesitant to do this because Saul's reputation as a persecutor of Christians was well known and widely feared. But Ananias gets up and he does what the Lord asks of him. And because of his faithfulness, Saul's blindness is healed. And he's rebaptized as Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, these are examples of inner calls, hearing a voice, having your conscience tweaked, sensing a new direction in your life, and trusting that this call is God blessed. These type of calls are more than just a gut instinct or just a passing inclination, they're deeper than that. They're a conviction. A knowledge that takes hold of your soul. Some people are gripped by this conviction when they realize how much they want to be a teacher or a doctor, a lawyer, a social worker, or yes, a minister. Some people heed this type of call when they realize it's time to move on to a new job. When it's okay to say yes to a relationship that's taking shape. Or when they need to step away from something that's destructive and move 
towards something that is new and life-giving. Now, unlike Ananias and Samuel, you likely will not hear God literally speaking to you, but the same God who is at work shaping the physical evolution of the world is also at work guiding the moral and spiritual evolution of all the world, including each of us. God calls to us. God urges us to move forward, to step away from what's wrong, and to step towards that which is right and just and life-giving. And God is persistent. So we can take heart. Hey, if you respond to God's call in less than four repetitions, you're doing better than Samuel, and Samuel was one of the most faithful people in the entire Bible. Our faith professes that God is moving us toward a better future, that God knows us completely and calls us to trust our inner spirits and to seek what is good. But there's one caveat that needs to be named as well. All of us like staying in our comfortable beds and sleeping through the night. All of us like going through our days with predictable routines, avoiding rocking the boat or making waves in the world. But evolution is by definition disruptive. To step forward by faith means stepping away from things that are currently flawed and moving towards the way God wants them to be. There's no getting around this disruptive movement. Kwame Anthony Appiah is a noted philosophy professor. He's taught at Yale and Harvard. He currently teaches at NYU. He tells the stories of being on airplanes, and when the person seated next to him discovers that he's a philosophy professor, sometimes they will ask him, so tell me, what is your philosophy of life? And Appiah will often say back, my philosophy is that Everything is more calculated than you, uh, is more complicated than you think it is. See, the easy voices in our life will tell us that everything is just fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't change a thing, and everything will work out. But if the past week or so has taught us anything at all, it's taught us that everything is not right. There's a lot that needs to change if things are going to turn out well. And see, that's the fundamental difference between easy voices and prophetic voices, between the, words, the world's call to complacency and God's call to evolve, to grow, to change. Ananias heard a call that told him to care for a man committed to destroying Christian leaders. Samuel heard a call that included a message to Eli and his sons that they were destined to fall from power. When Jeremiah was a young man, he received a call to be a prophet. And the Lord touched his mouth and then said to him, Today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, and then to build and to plant. And think, how many times did Jesus, when addressing the crowds, tell them that the old way of doing things must give way to something different, saying, well, you've heard it said, but today I say to you. Evolution, physical and spiritual evolution, means moving away from one way and moving towards a new way of life. It's complicated, as Professor Appiah has said. It's daunting, as Samuel discovered. It's hard and troubling, as was long said by Jeremiah and Jesus. But if we're honest, if we trust that God is at work in us for good, then answering those inner calls is always the right decision. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech in 1967 for the convention of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And a portion of that speech you will hear right after this sermon. Now in it, he spoke about God's 
expressions of divine dissatisfaction. How God calls us to change. Divine dissatisfaction is something that's actually very real. It's that part of our conscience that knows right from wrong and is troubled whenever wrong prevails, whenever truth is corrupted by lies from high places, when standards of decency and justice are trampled upon like the rampaging rioters who overran the Capitol and whose rabid rhetoric has cast a pall over this Wednesday's upcoming inauguration. It's the divine dissatisfaction when bureaucratic incompetence allows thousands to die daily from the coronavirus, when wealth remains safeguarded by the few to the impoverishment of the many, when souls ache for change, heavy with the dissatisfaction of unevolved, unenlightened laws and racist, unjust social systems. But God is patient and persistent. God called to Samuel four times, and God is still calling to us. The first step is change. In this moral evolution, it is to trust that call and to pray the prayer of Samuel, to quiet ourselves and then to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We can say those words even when we're weary and tired. We can pray that prayer even when we're confused and concerned. We can say them like Dr. King did on that night when he was awakened from sleep with another angry voice and another threat to destroy him and his family that shook him to his core. And it caused him to sit at his kitchen table and to pray for clarity because his faith was shaken. And in that moment, he heard the call, the voice of God saying, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and I will be with you. The stuff of this universe, both physical and moral, is evolving towards God's kingdom goals. As I mentioned last week, to answer that call means that we are first to push back against the powers of chaos and injustice and create a space, a level playing field for peace, justice, truth, equality, and order. And then as I've said today, we are also called to quiet ourselves and then offer the prayer of Samuel, of Ananias, of Martin Luther King Jr., and say, speak, O God, your servant is listening. By taking that step, we move forward by faith, and the horizon of the realm of God draws that much closer to reality. And for that evolution, thanks be to God. Amen. As I mentioned, we will now see a portion of King's 1967 speech to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Remember, King at his heart was a preacher. So we hear him express words about divine dissatisfaction and hear his prophetic call for change. And we have a task and let us go out with the divine dissatisfaction. Let us be dissatisfied until America will no longer have a high blood pressure of creeds and an anemia of deeds. Let us be dissatisfied until the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort from the inner city of poverty and despair shall be crushed by the battering rams of the forces of justice. Let us be dissatisfied until they live on the outskirts of hope, are brought into the metropolis of daily security. Let us be dissatisfied until slums are cast into the junk heaps of history and every family will live in a decent sanitary home. Let us be dissatisfied until the dark yesterdays of segregated schools will be transformed into bright tomorrows of quality, integrated education. Let us be dissatisfied 
until integration is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. Let us be dissatisfied until men and women, however black they may be, will be judged on the basis of the content of their character, not on the basis of the color of their skin. Let us be dissatisfied. Let us be dissatisfied until every state capital will be housed by a governor who will do justly, who will love mercy, and who will walk humbly with his God. Let us be dissatisfied until from every city hall justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let us be dissatisfied until that day when the lion and the lamb shall lie down together. And every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree, and none shall be afraid. Let us be dissatisfied. Until men will recognize that out of one blood, God made all men to dwell upon the face of the earth. Let us be dissatisfied until that day when nobody will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power, but everybody will talk about God's power and human power. <laughs>